Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Big news, big debate, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Christopher Hope, this is GB News, Britain's election channel. Hello, and welcome to the world of Whittacombe. And as you may have guessed, I'm not Sir Jacob Rees-Mogg. That's because GB News has fired him and replaced him with me. April Fools. But the following stories are not April Fools, though in some cases I wish they were. So, on State of the Nation tonight, the Scottish Government has hammered the final nail in the coffin for free expression, as the new Hate Crime Act comes into effect today, with an SNP minister claiming that J.K. Rowling could face investigation, or maybe even prosecution for her gender-critical positions. Uh, but for those of you concerned about this new law, worry not, for Police Scotland have issued a bizarre explainer video involving an animated hate monster. Today marks the coming into effect of the government's long overdue ban on puberty blockers for children, with some 5,000 children on the waiting list for gender identity treatment. And, do swastikas need to be taken in context? That's what a Metropolitan policeman told a woman at this weekend's Palestine march. Plus, I'll be speaking to an evangelical priest live from Jerusalem about what it's like celebrating Easter in the Holy Land, and especially during these times of war. So, State of the Nation starts now. I'll also be joined by an exuberant panel this evening, New Culture Forum fellow and broadcaster Emma Webb and the contributing editor to Novara Media, Michael Walker. Despite Jacob's absence, the email remains the same, mailmog at gbnews.com. So let me know what you're thinking. But now it's time for the news of the day with Tatiana Sanchez. And thank you very much and good evening, the top stories. Campaigners in Edinburgh have delivered a coffin outside the Scottish Parliament, symbolising what they say is the death of free speech. It's after the introduction of a new hate crime law which makes it a crime to stir up hatred against people with protected characteristics. That includes disability, age, sexual orientation or people who are transgender. Gender critical author J.K. Rowling said it risks outlawing genuine debate over biological sex, while some police forces have raised concerns that complaints could be lodged for political reasons. The Scottish Conservatives say resources should be directed towards frontline policing. Plans to fine rough sleepers are provoking outrage, with more than 40 Conservative MPs said to be preparing to rebel. 
The new criminal justice bill would allow police to fine or move on so-called nuisance rough sleepers. It was intended to replace the Vagrancy Act from 1824, which currently criminalises both rough sleeping and begging. But reports suggest the new bill has been paused while ministers negotiate with MPs who are concerned about the consequences of issuing fines to homeless people. The plans were introduced by former Home Secretary Suella Braverman, who branded rough sleeping a lifestyle choice. More than 5,400 migrants have been intercepted crossing the English Channel in small boats during the first three months of this year. It's a record figure for that quarter, up 43% compared to the same time in 2023. Official figures from the Home Office show 442 people made the crossing in nine small boats yesterday. That's despite difficult weather conditions, with lifeboats scrambling to assist some of the arrivals. Today's strong winds have now made the journey completely impassable. The head of the Nurses' Union has accused the government of packing hospital corridors with patients and says the quality of care is not only undignified but fatally unsafe. It comes as new estimates suggest more than 250 patients a week in England may have died needlessly last year because of long waits for a hospital bed. A report by the Royal College of Emergency Medicine revealed more than 1.5 million patients waited in emergency departments for longer than 12 hours last year. The Department for Health says it added thousands of hospital beds and insists it's making progress on waiting times. And energy bills are due to fall to their lowest rate in two years after the regulator Ofgem cut its price cap by 12.3%. It means the average household bill for gas and electricity will fall by around £238 over the course of a year, or about £20 a month. However, around 10 million households are still being urged to submit meter readings to avoid overpayment. For the latest stories, sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Now it's back to Anne. Well, the Scottish Government has hammered down the final nail in the coffin of freedom of expression. Today marks the Scottish Nationalists' Hate Crime Act coming into full effect with 411 centres being set up across the region, whereby individuals can go and report their fellow citizens for allegedly stirring up hatred against a given social group. This law was actually passed back in March of 2021, uh, when the very little Miss Nicola Sturgeon uh, was still in power. But the current First Minister, Hamza Youssef, was then the Justice Secretary and very much behind this legislation. Indeed, the legislation builds on existing UK law, namely the Public Order Act 1986. Now, although I'm not a fan of the Act, owing to its vagueness, at least it recognised one sensible principle, that the law ought to protect private conversations inside people's own homes. But Humza Yousaf's censorship law does away even with that. Indeed, back in 2020, before the law passed, he explicitly said, Are we comfortable giving a defence to somebody whose behaviour is threatening or abusive, or which is, which is intentionally stirring up hatred? Are we saying that that's justified because it's in the home? So, under Humza Yousaf's tyrannical rule, not only are the freedoms of the public forum being eroded, but the freedom to say what you like within the four walls of your own home. But this law defines hate crime as any crime which is understood by the victim or any other person as being motivated, wholly or partly, by malice or ill will towards a social group. In other words, impartiality is discarded, evidence is discarded, all that matters is the perception of the complainant. Already we're seeing the looming consequences of this legislation. Just today, Siobhan Brown, the SNP's Community Safety Minister, suggested that J.K. Rowling's so-called misgendering of trans-identifying individuals could be liable to prosecution. But Humza Yousaf really ought to be careful not to throw stones in the glass house of Hollywood. Hollywood. 
The words were malice or ill will towards a social group. So can I remind you of what he said in 2020? Lord Justice Clark, white. Every High Court judge, white. The Lord Advocate, white. The Solicitor General, white. The Chief Constable, white. Every Deputy Chief Constable, white. Every Assistant Chief Constable, white. The Head of the Law Society, white. The Head of the Faculty of Advocates, white. Every Prison Governor, white. And not just Justice. The Chief Medical Officer, white. The Chief Nursing Officer, white. The Chief Veterinary Officer, white. The Chief Social Work Advisor, white. Almost every trade union in this country headed by people who are white. In the Scottish Government, every Director General is white. Every chair of every public body is white. Oh, wouldn't it be a shame if someone were to take this legislation to its natural conclusion and report Humza Yousaf to the police for a clear display of malice or ill will towards white people? That Scotland's ethnic makeup is actually 95% white seems completely lost on this Scottish dictator. Funnily enough, Hamza Youssef was reported to the police for breaking the SNP's Hate Crime Act when he said, quite justifiably, about a year ago, that the transgender rapist Isla Bryson should not have been in a women's prison. And he said, Isla Bryson is a rapist who's completely at it. I don't think they're a genuine trans woman. I think they're trying to play the system. But how interesting that he insisted on referring to Isla Bryson as they. But it just goes to show that regulating speech is not only undesirable, but it's also practically impossible. Police Scotland have promised to investigate every single complaint. But with nearly 7,000 complaints between 21 and 22, it's clearly untenable. Or perhaps this pledge has something to do with Police Scotland uh, have implemented a new trial to simply not investigate certain types of crime, with an estimated 24,000 offences a year no longer being allocated to frontline officers. Well, if you're confused by any of this from Police Scotland, don't worry, don't worry. They've issued a profoundly helpful explainer about hate crimes last year involving the hate monster. He'll make you want to have a go at somebody. A neighbour, somebody on the street, on a night out, security guy on the door, somebody in the chappy, your taxi driver. He'll make you want to vent your anger, just because folk look or act different for you. The hate monster wants you to feel what you need to show. You're better than them. Then, before you know it, you've committed a hate crime. Well, I'll make of that what you will. And do let me know as well at mailmog at gbnews.com. Well, with me now to discuss this is the barrister, discrimination barrister, Robin Moira White. Welcome, Robin. Good evening, Anne. Now, let me tell you what really worries me about this piece of legislation. It's that the perception of a crime being committed um, is not based on whether that person intended to commit a crime or not, but whether the victim, in inverted commas, uh, or anybody else, for that matter, who happened to hear whatever was said, uh, determines that um, it was motivated by malice or ill will. What sort of justice is that? Well, there are a number of protections in the Act, including a reasonableness test. So if a person unreasonably forms that view about why someone has done what they've done... Now, if there's evidence that they intended to a committed a hate crime, they, they sent someone an email before saying we're going to deal with that disabled person that we hate around the corner, then that would show intention. And if their actions reasonably show that that's what they intended to do by the way they act, then, the, the, then liability is fixed. But it's not uh, a completely free shot in the way that you suggest. Well, isn't it? Because if, I mean, if there's an email that does imply, I agree with you, that, that implies intent. Um, but most of these things come out in, in heated exchanges or in, you know, very casual exchanges. Mm. Uh, and then somebody says, oh, I'm offended or I'm hurt or I'm whatever because this was clearly uh, malicious and it's against me as a, uh, a, a black person um, or a, a transgender uh, or sexual uh, sexuality, whatever it might be. And somebody says, 
I perceive this to be uh, motivated by hate. Mm. Now, at that point, the, what is the reasonable test um, that anybody could apply as to what was in somebody's mind at the time? You don't know what I'm thinking now. I don't know what you're thinking now. Why is it that a crime can be committed on the basis of what somebody is alleged to be thinking? Well, that's also how discrimination often works, because people have worked out these days that saying something or sending an email like one I received some years ago that said, let's go round her place with pickaxe handles and balaclavas and see what we can do. Now, that's an email that was sent about me. People have worked out that you don't do that. But from the circumstance of what happens, if racial taunts were being shouted, if taunts about someone's protective protected characteristic were being shouted in the run-up to what then happened, it would be pretty obvious that that was a hate crime. But we know, for example, that street preachers have been arrested, uh, merely for quoting the Bible, um, and without actually intending you know, in anything beyond that. Uh, on one occasion, a, a cafe owner uh, was visited by the police because he was just running consistently the whole of the Bible through. Uh, and, you know, people were looking to pick out particular verses that they could then say, well, you know, this is against our current law. Um, it seems to me there's a huge, huge scope for mischief. Well, you, you uh, correctly said that this, this Act uh, is now, what, three years since it was passed, and it spent a long time working its way through the Scottish Parliament, and some very specific protections were added in. I, I know the European Convention on Human Rights is perhaps not a... Um, a piece of legislation that GB News uh, uh, viewers are, are great fans of. But Article 10, which protects free speech, is written very specifically into this Act. And so if what you're doing is intended to, to shock uh, or cause someone distress or give offence, then that very specifically doesn't reach the level where a criminal offence would have been committed under this Act. Has J.K. Rowling committed a criminal offence? Uh, fortunately, I don't... It's not my job to determine that. Uh, if... Uh, I think it's, a, it's been a pr pretty um, unimpressive 24 hours or so with people apparently attempting to get as close to the line as they can and see whether anybody's going to suggest that their toes are across it. If people are demonising a particular group then that's quite concerning. But what is demonising? I mean, if you say, you know, biology is biology, yeah. uh, and somebody such as J.K. Rowling, for example, doesn't believe um, that you can change what biology has decreed, um, is that hatred or is that just a, a reasoned position? Well, let's take an example that's away... It's sometimes useful to take examples that are away from the, uh, the point at the moment. And if someone was putting out a message that said, here are all these people of colour who have committed uh, criminal acts, and from that you should draw an assumption about people of colour, we would recognise that that's wholly a wrong thing to do. And if someone is doing that with another protected group and saying, from this group of people, you should draw an implication about the whole group, but it's not saying, you know, this group of people is bad, this group of people, you know, shouldn't have rights. It's not saying that. It's simply saying that she, J.K. Rowling, believes that you can't change biological facts. As a matter of fact, I believe that as well. well if, now, am if I guilty of a hate crime? If she's saying that, then no, that plainly wouldn't be across the line into a hate crime. But if she's saying that you should act differently or inappropriately towards people because of that, then that probably would be across the line. Robin, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you. After the break, today marks the official banning of puberty blockers being issued to children, with more than 5,000 in the UK waiting for so-called gender identity treatment. And don't forget, we'll be going live to the Holy Land to speak to an evangelical priest about Easter in Jerusalem. GB News Breakfast, every day from 6 a.m. He's a genius. We know he's one of the few geniuses in the world. We have Mozart, we have perhaps Leonardo mm. da Vinci. He's mm. a genius. Of course, he's worth, uh, they... worth, worth studying. <clears throat> but, Chris, did they not think that Ben Johnson wrote some of his works? 
Well, that's interesting, isn't it? Some people say that. There's lots of, there's lots of people out there who, who will question who wrote the plays. What's really important, of course, is the quality of the writing. And I, can I just add, I have some sympathy for my opponent in this debate because I'm afraid he's going to have to justify something which many people will disagree with. But good luck to him. But I think we all know Shakespeare was well, a genius. I'm sure my <laughs> that's here from Ryan. Well. This is Ryan Mark Parsons, who's a former star of The Apprentice. Tell mm. us more, Ryan. Well, I agree with the other guests. I'm not denying Shakespeare's cultural relevance and significance in history. I mean, I admire Shakespeare. But I guess in terms of his relevance, if you were to define relevance, that, well, the Oxford Dictionary says it's appropriate to the time, context and circumstances. And I think there's an argument to be had about whether Shakespeare is relevant in 2024. Let's just look at the language that he uses. It's extremely archaic. It's almost elitist because you have to have studied his works in order to understand the plays in which he wrote. So I just want to tear my hair out when you say that. I mean, well, you know, it's true. he survives for 500 years and then the Gen Zers chuck it up the wall. And you say it's not relevant. Oh, he's more relevant than ever because what Shakespeare does is tells us about human nature. The human nature in the 16th century was no, or the 17th century. It was no different from today. You know, if you're looking at Vladimir Putin's headlines today, well, read Julius Caesar. It's just the language can be difficult, but that's good because we need to stretch children. We need to present children with things which challenge them. Don't always make life easier for children. Absolutely. No, make them stretch them a little bit. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. I'm Anne Whittacom, covering Sir Jacob Rees-Mogg's State of the Nation. And we've been discussing the death of free speech in Scotland, and you've been getting in touch with your male mogs. Now, Mick says, free speech is slowly being crushed in this country. Well, not so slowly, maybe. Thank goodness we can still fly our fusticas without causing offence. The world has gone quite mad. And Patricia says... Great to see Anne Whittacombe on the show and how lovely she looks. Oh, thank you, Patricia. Do keep mailing. Now, last month, the government made the long overdue announcement to ban the use of puberty blockers for children being given so-called gender identity treatment. And it came after the controversial Tavistock Centre in North London was officially closed after an independent review led by Dr Hilary Cass heavily criticised its practices. Today marks the new opening of regional gender identity treatment clinics, which align themselves with the recommendations of the CAS review. So, crucially, these new centres will not be issuing puberty blockers to children, after the NHS recognised last year that there is, and I quote, not enough evidence to support the safety or clinical effectiveness of puberty-suppressing hormones to make the treatment routinely available at this time. Well, I'm joined now by Joanne Lockwood, founder and CEO of Sea Change, Happen, a diversity, inclusion and belonging practice. Uh, welcome, Joanne. So... Hi, uh, you Good evening. Good evening. You can't um, buy a drink in the pub until you're 18. Why on earth you, should you be able uh, to sign up for medical treatment that can be irreversible and which you can actually regret later on? Well, I joined the Royal Air Force at the age of 16 and was firing a, an automatic weapon before I, was, uh, before I was 18. So we could do a lot of things um, before we're 18. 
So I, I dispute the fact that uh, being 18 means that we don't necessarily have the competency. You know, Gillick competency is around understanding a person's understanding of the, of the decisions they're making. And I think people as young as 10, 11 years old have demonstrated Gillick competency without a problem. Well, we've had the example, for example, of Kira Bell, who says that she just didn't understand what she was doing, came to regret it, couldn't wholly reverse it and has suffered from that ever since. Now, what is the harm in making sure that children have reached the age of majority and have become adults uh, before they make life-changing, and it is life-changing, decisions of that order of magnitude? I think it's important to recognise that uh, everybody develops their sense of self from a, a younger age than the age of majority, you know, the, the age of 18, as you describe it. Uh, people are allowed to make decisions about their lives at the age of 16. We know that uh, young people have a fully competent understanding of who they are, even earlier than that. So I think it's important that what we do is we listen to individuals, not make blanket statements, not uh, make policy based on everyone. If we're, if we're focusing on individuals, then we can provide specialised care specialised support not only to the individual but also to their family to avoid distress and poor mental health. Well, where you say, where, where you say there that, that the people under 18 uh, can make you know, decisions about their lives, I think you've missed out one very vital word, irreversible decisions. Irreversible people, decisions. People, now, people, is it people, reasonable that a teenager can do it? Well, the fact people, is people, that... aren't irreversible. We, We've been prescribing them through medical professionals throughout the world for the past 40 years, safely and effectively. It's, it's never been proved that these are irreversible. You know, in fact, the, the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, WPATH, still recommends this is the course of action that should be taken. Uh, so, even in the so US, Hil which we know is hostile to trans people. So Hillary Cass is wrong, yeah? Is that your view? Hillary Cass is I'm wrong. Hillary, I'm, I, I'm not a medical professional. I'm not saying Hillary Cass is wrong. Clearly, but she is, and there she were thinks is... in the support. Well, she clearly thinks there very clearly. In the yeah, Hillary yeah. Cass uh, is a medical professional, and it is her view uh, that prescribing puberty blockers for people under 18 uh, is a dangerous path to go. But thank you very much for that, Joanne. Great to have had you on the program. Well, now I'm coming to my panel. Um, New Culture Forum uh, fellow performer, uh, Emma <laughs> Webb, uh, and uh, Michael Walker, who is um, the contributing editor to Novara Media, I think. So you've heard what, uh, what Joanne had to say there. Um, you've heard, presumably, what Hilary Cass has to say. Uh, after a very long time, indeed, we've now arrived at this present state of the law, whereby uh, children... Uh, under the age of 18 won't get that. Um, so, Emma, who's right? Well, Joanne mentioned WPATH there, and we've actually just had a leak of, of the of what has been referred to as the WPATH files. Andrew Doyle actually did a very good show on it on this uh, channel. Um, and it's very clear that Joanne said that puberty blockers are not irreversible. Well, actually, there are communications between staff um, who have, are involved in um, what I think is frankly experimental medicine on children that show that their their doubts about these things that this is this is using children as guinea pigs and that there have been cases as well where. Um, after using puberty blockers at a young age, which I think you mentioned consent already, um, there is, without going into gruesome detail, not enough okay, material... Emma, Emma let, let me just bring in Michael there. Um, I think it's a genuinely difficult issue. I can see both sides of the argument. I suppose what many people are advocating, or, or why many, and we should be clear, many people who are adult and trans, they look back at their past and they say, well, my transition would have been much easier if I started it a bit earlier. Because you've said puberty blockers aren't reversible. Now, I know there's sort of medical debate about the long-term impact of them. I don't really want to weigh in on that. But the other thing that's not reversible is puberty. So if you do want to live your life um, as a trans person, then it is much easier to sort of pass and be treated as the, the gender you've chosen um, to, to live as if you haven't gone through puberty. So I can, I can see both arguments here. My, my inclination is to leave it to the medical profession because I don't think it's particularly helpful for anyone if this becomes a highly politicised issue. Emma, 
Don't bother with the politics, leave it to the medics. I don't think we can trust the medics now that we've seen the conversation that have happened between um, some of those at you know, Tavistock or th that were leaked in the W Path files. But I just want to add to what you said there about puberty not being reversible. Well, the reality is that somebody who hasn't gone through puberty yet is too young to make that kind of decision. There are ex extreme concerns about um, this almost being a form of conversion therapy, that, that young gay people who might be experiencing gender dysphoria um, or, or are just simply, you know, further down the line going to turn out to be gay are being, you know, you've heard the phrase transing the gay away. Um, and that's why there are so many um, people from either, either lesbians or gays who are so outspoken against this because they're concerned that, like you say, puberty isn't reversible, but a young person does doesn't have the, the the faculties to be able to make such a serious decision. It's effectively sterilising. Final, final point from so, you, Michael. So I mean, I, I think there are arguments on both sides. I think this is a very difficult decision, and, and I mean, you can talk about uncertainty among the medical profession as a sort of reason why this is sort of conspiratorial and, and, and unreasonable and irresponsible. But actually. I think they'd all openly admit there's a lot of uncertainty here. It's a new sort of realm of medicine. I'm, I'm, really I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to say, I'm going to have to say thank you to my panel. Coming up, should swastikas be taken in context? That's what a metropolitan policeman has told a member of the public at a Palestine march. Plus, we'll be discussing the importance of Easter with an evangelical priest live in Jerusalem. Hello there, welcome to your latest GB News weather. Over the next 24 hours or so, we'll see the heavy showers fade away. It will often remain quite cloudy, but there will be some brighter spells into Tuesday. Low pressure dominating the weather pattern at the moment, but a slack area of low pressure. So we've had some slow moving heavy showers. These slowly fading away through this evening time. We do have a frontal system as well across parts of Scotland, the far north of England giving some spells of rain. Into the early hours, we could see some clear spells through this central swathe of the UK. And here, temperatures dipping into low single figures and some further showers running across southern coastal counties of England too. Just a mixed picture for Tuesday, some bright sunny spells across this central part of the UK, Wales into the Midlands for example, this frontal system across eastern parts of Scotland continues to give outbreaks of rain through the day. Into the afternoon we'll see some showers bubble up for many areas but there'll be plenty of sunny spells, some rain in the southwest later. Temperatures in the sunshine reaching around 15 or 16 Celsius, still cold under the cloud and rain for Scotland. Into Wednesday, the next area of low pressure moves in, pushing rain north and eastwards across the country. Some of this could be heavy at times. Behind it, some showers following in, but also some brighter skies. And towards the end of the week, it turns wetter and windier. But with winds from the south, temperatures start to rise. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Welcome back. I'm Anne Whittacombe, standing in for Sir Jacob Rees-Mogg on State of the Nation. 
and we've been discussing the official banning of puberty blockers. And you've been getting in touch with your mail mogs. Sai says your guest was misleading. He served in the Air Force at 16, firing an automatic weapon. Neglected to mention parental consent, and you can't serve in the military under 18 without the consent of your parents. Now, over the weekend, it was business as usual, as the Palestine marchers took to the streets of London with the typical calls of from the river to the sea echoing throughout Trafalgar Square. But then this happened. You like to walk with me because I can point these people out to you. And again, I was told when I asked that a swastika was not necessarily anti-Semitic or disruptive to public worship. That doesn't seem right to me. Everything needs to be taken in context, doesn't it? Yeah, but it's a context of hate. But why, why does a con why does this swastika need context? What, what, what exactly are you confused about? What, what I'm confused is how you don't, in what context yeah. a swastika is not anti-Semitic. This is what I want to know. Because again... I suppose, to some, I don't know uh, how... Everybody would feel about that song. The drive that that has happened. I cannot. I'm here working to the branch commander, and it is not my responsibility, unfortunately, my role to walk down the road. So, in a United Kingdom, where by misgendering someone can leave you actually on the wrong side of the law, carrying a swastika through the streets of London on a Palestine march ought to be taken in context. I really do wonder to which context. The officer is referring. Now I'm joined again by my panel, New Culture Fellow for uh, New Culture Forum Fellow and Broadcaster Emma Webb, and the contributing editor to Novara Media, Michael Walker. So, Michael, what is a good context for a swastika? I mean, of course, there is no good context for a swastika. I mean, I do have to say, in a way, I do feel a little bit sorry for that police officer because, in his defence, he was basically saying. It's not my duty as an operational frontline police officer to decide what is and what is not offensive. I get told that by my guard commander. I would also imagine, so these social media videos sort of exist a lot, and I think what they probably went up to is went up to like loads and loads of police officers that day and then uploaded the most embarrassing answer. Of course it was a bad answer. It, it was a bad answer that's plain to see for everyone watching Can this. there be such a thing as a policeman who doesn't know what a swastika implies? Well, so I assume the context he's talking about. So I've been on these demonstrations. Um, I've seen lots of people very concerned about people getting pill killed Sorry, um, in what the International Court of Justice thinks could be a genocide or war, right? I haven't seen any swastikas. If they were telling the truth, and it could be the case, you know, we still haven't seen evidence that this sign existed, I would imagine what it would have been doing would be comparing the Israeli government to the Nazis. Now, I think that shouldn't be done. I think that's very problematic. But you can understand how, as a police officer, someone saying, I support the Nazis, and I think this government is bad and is a bit like the Nazis, those are two very different contexts. Now, I think both of those contexts are bad, but there are different contexts in which one can be shown. Any context in which a swastika is not offensive, is not anti-Semitic? There is only one context, and that would be at something like a Hindu wedding. Um, and actually, we've seen the police do this little rhetorical trick before when they there was a, a, a banner being held up at a Hitzbut to here rally, now prescribed, prescribed in all, all sorts of other countries, um, an Islamist group, holding up banners talking about Muslim armies and chanting uh, jihad. And the police also said that in that particular context, they were referring to spiritual jihad, of course, not military jihad. Um, we've seen uh, another um, man who was arrested and then re unarrested, released, without charge, for holding up a poster that said Hamas are terrorists, which is both a statement of fact and also the position of, the, of UK law. Oh, UK law, yeah. Um, so we have seen time and time again the police behaving in a, in a way that is... Um, it's been described as two-tier policing. Um, it is um, enormously troubling for Jews. And I don't think it matters. It, so it's, I think, I believe that the person, um, you said that there's no proof that that existed. I think that person has now been arrested. But I do think it's mm. very important to add to that, that regardless of whatever the broader context was of this video that was clipped, the way the police officer behaves in that video is um, unprofessional. And there is a senior police officer yeah. behind him that should have stepped in. Michael. Yeah. Final question. Oh, go on. Yes. If you were a Jew looking at that sign, would you have felt intimidated and unsafe? 
I think any sign with a swastika should not be waved in, in, in London, and, and that's the reason why. So, yes, I mean, we haven't seen the sign, but I, I, I don't think people should be waving signs with swastikas on them in London. Well, we've now received a statement from the Met Police which said, this clip is a short excerpt of what was a 10-minute conversation with an officer. During the full conversation, the officer establishes that the woman the person was concerned about had already been arrested for a public order offence in relation to a placard. Anyway, Rishi Shunak is facing a revolt, what's new there, over the criminal justice bill, as critics say new powers given to police would effectively criminalise homelessness. The bill, which was announced by the former Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, and is to be voted on before the general election, could see, could see rough sleepers moved on or fined up to £2,500 or jailed. So, is the government tackling a serious problem that negatively affects the lives of the law-abiding? Or are we cruelly punishing people for falling on hard times? Well, I'm going to turn to my esteemed panel. This time I'm going to start with Michael. So, Michael, uh, what sort of homeless sleeper can pay 2500 in a fine? None. Um, well, I suppose unless we believe Suella Braverman, who thinks that being homeless is a lifestyle choice, but my response to that was always, and why, does, why, why do more people choose this lifestyle whenever the Conservatives are in government? Because street homelessness does tend to go down when Labour are in government and go up when the Conservatives are. Um, so, yeah, I, I think the idea of fining homeless people £2,500 is grotesque. Um, obviously, it's not going to work. You're not going to get £2,500 off, off someone who's homeless. I can only presume that they won't be able to pay the fine and then we'll end up in prison, which is going to be an enormous cost to the taxpayer. Emma, I've talked to people sleeping rough on the streets and I do know that in some cases I've been able to point them directly to help, not very far away, which was immediately mm -hmm. available, and they've refused it. Mm -hmm. So is there an element of choice there? I think... There is, we do definitely have an issue with organised gangs and begging, which I think the government rightly wants to address. I think the issue of um, voluntary homelessness is quite complicated because those people probably have mental health issues uh, or drugs issues, and there'll be a reason why they're on the street. Um, but I do think that the Conservatives who are rebelling against this are right, because, they, I mean, the, the, the proposal of the bill is to replace the Vagrancy Act. Um, and the idea that you could find somebody over £2,000 who's homeless is just is a ridiculous suggestion. It's not going to deal with the problem, uh, particularly in London. We have an enormous uh, number that's obviously increased since the pandemic of rough sleepers. Um, I don't think that this, it, this proposal is going to do anything to alleviate that. Um, I also think that there seems to be something that is inherently wrong um, with criminalising homelessness in general. That's the criticism of the Act, is that it's too vague. Yes, there are certain things that do need to be dealt with, but, it, but sh we shouldn't be criminalising people who, through no fault of their own, whether um, through mental health or through circumstance, have ended up on the streets. Michael? I mean, I think even if it is through fault of that, I mean, I suppose you're saying people don't always make what we would think to be the right decision. Now, that's clearly the yeah. case. But it'd be, you know, being, a, being addicted but to drugs is also a, not a lifestyle you're choice because help, you're, in, you're in a very difficult situation. As Emma said, you might Michael, have mental health problems. if you're offered help or... and, you, and, you know, immediate help, not mm -hmm. some vague promise, if you're offered immediate help and you refuse it, are you not making a choice? Um, well, I mean, there's an element of choice there. I suppose the reason is why have they not taken it? As the reason they've not taken it because they're a drug addict and they don't want to go into that sheltered accommodation because then they... They won't be able to feed their, their habit. Now, obviously, that's, they haven't made a good choice there, <laughs> but it's sort of difficult necessarily to blame them for that choice because we know how drug addiction works and we know how severe mental health problems work, which is that they might not give you the agency mm -hmm. that you know, we might feel that we have in our day-to-day -day lives. I thank my panel for that one. But coming up next, how have Christians marked the Easter season in the conflict-ridden Middle East? And just why are evangelical churches recruiting in droves while the Church of England numbers dwindle? Dubes & Co. Weekdays from 6pm. 
this story caught my eye. Lloyds Bank, right, they own the insurance company Scottish Widows. They have now um, issued some kind of suggested guidance about which word to try and avoid, to try and avoid upsetting people or perhaps be as inclusive as possibly can be. One of these words is widows, which really caught my eye because of the amount of stupidity. If you own a brand literally called Scottish Widows, you can't then be saying that the word widows is triggering an offensive. Anyway, because it is so ludicrous, I need to move over from that part <laughs> because I want to talk about the broader issue. So yeah. many organisations, they have what they call ESG. I'm going to bring a graphic up on the screen uh, in case you're not familiar with what this is. But it's a sense of kind of government, and I would say it's almost like a spine. It underpins so much of what business does today. It stands for environmental, social and governance. And it's around things like um, how does a business perform when it comes to their environmental uh, impact? How diverse are their employees, how diverse is their board, and so on and so forth. Do you think ESG is a force for good and much needed within business or not, Ben? It is the introduction of systemic institutionalised prejudice in the United Kingdom, which is going to damage dreadfully our economy, but also our culture, our cohesion as a society, and it's undermining, again, coming back to it, the nation-state that is the United Kingdom. ESG has to be ditched. Mm, strong words, Judita. Do you agree with him? I don't agree because I think that with ESG, when you have them, what you're having an increase in is specialists in ESG being introduced into companies to, in, to kind of imbricate it into how the company functions. If you're moving in a direction of making your, com your company's functionality be optimized in a way that is inclusive of anyone from any background who has the qualifications to occupy that position, that is a good thing. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Welcome back. The Easter season is still upon us with commemorations of Christ's resurrection still being commemorated by Christians across the world. And nowhere is that more poignant than the site of the event itself, the Holy Land. As we all know, the region is embattled in a territorial and religious conflict between the Jewish state of Israel and the is Islamist group Hamas. But the region's Christians are embroiled in the disputes just as much as any other group. So just how are they commemorating this most sacred event in the Middle East, in their calendar, in the wake of the conflict? And why are evangelicals growing in droves whilst the C of E numbers continuing to dwindle? Well, I'm pleased to say that I'm now joined from Jerusalem by Bishop Dr. Munib Yunan, who's the Bishop Emeritus of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Jordan and the Holy Land. Bishop, good evening. Good evening. And, Good evening. And thank you very much for joining us. Can you tell me something about how Easter is going uh, in the Holy Land? Well, I think, you know, um, we are celebrating now the Western, you know, um, uh, Easter. Still in five months, we are will be celebrating the Orthodox, which takes, of course, uh, which, of course, is a calendar issue. Now, this year, it was a special one because we are living in the war situation. So the Israeli authorities did not allow, you know, uh, Christians from the West Bank uh, to enter to, um, uh, to, uh, to Jerusalem in order to celebrate uh, uh, with the other Christians. For example, you know, the uh, traditional, um, um, uh, the, the traditional um, um, Palm Sunday procession, which starts from Beit Faji through Gethsemane to St. Anne, usually, 
we have 30,000. This year, we're only 3,000 because Christians could not, uh, from the West Bank, were not allowed to participate in that. Even though, even with all these things, we have to bring the, the hope of the resurrection, the hope of the risen Lord to our people, even in such a difficult and depressing situation in which we, in which we are. Today, for example, we are celebrating also uh, the Emmaus, uh, the two disciples of Emmaus who were really um, uh, going to Emmaus and they met Jesus Christ, you know. And then when he broke the bread, they could. Uh, when he broke the bread, he understood. They understood that he is risen. And we live with this hope that he is risen. And in this country that is suffering, you know, occupation, suffering, uh, war, suffering, you know, um, violence. Um, uh, suffering dehumanization, will one day, you know, with the help of God, we will we will get our justice, uh, peace based on justice, for for us and for every Bishop, nation. Bishop, th thank you very much for that description. I'm sure we're all praying for uh, Christians in the Holy Land, as we are praying for all those who are uh, involved in this conflict. Uh, and it must be an extremely difficult time. Can I just uh, ask you something else? Uh, in this country, the, uh, the evangelical churches are uh, doing really rather well. The um, established church in this country, the Church of England, uh, the congregations are dwindling. Uh, do you know or have you any ideas why that would happen? Why is it increasing in one uh, area, decreasing in another? Well, there are... We, there are if when you speak about evangelicals, there are three kinds of evangelicals. There are the mainline evangelicals like Lutherans, Anglicans, Methodists, you know, Presbyterians. Yep. There are also evangelicals like the, the Baptists who are ecumenical and who join us also in World Council of Churches. And there are those who are really, uh, there are the evangelicals or the evangelistic groups that are non-ecumenical and, you know, they are, spreading everywhere. Now, what is the reason for that? It's difficult exactly what to say or the reason. Maybe sometimes they have, you know, a clear, a clear cutting, you know, um, decisions on certain social ethical issues, which sometimes our churches, you know, mainline churches do not have like them. But at the same time, I would like really to tell you very clearly, Today, we are noticing that the growth of mainline churches are in Africa and China, not in the Western countries. And, and the future of Christianity will be in Africa and China. And that's the reason, and that's the reason we have to see that, they, that, for example, the two largest churches today for us Lutherans in the world are in Ethiopia and in Tanzania. In the past, it used to be maybe it used to be a Sweden, a Sweden or or Norway or Germany. You, you can see that things are moving. At the same time, we are not ashamed to preach uh, uh, the gospel of Christ to every, everybody. At the Bishop, same time, Bunin, Bishop, thank you very much. That's a, a very, very good note to end on about not being ashamed to, to preach the gospel. Um, and I am very grateful to you for joining us tonight. However, I've still got Emma with me. Now, Emma, you're an Anglican. Uh, I'm a Catholic, let me, uh, let me declare that right away. You're an Anglican. Um, congregations are dwindling in the Anglican church. Churches are being closed. Uh, some parishes are joining together because they haven't got enough in each. Um, and yet the evangelical churches are growing. Now, I think the bishop hit the nail on the head right at the end there, uh, mm -hmm. where he said, because they're not ashamed to preach the gospel of Christ, is it the question that people actually want a strong message rather than reparations for slavery several hundred years ago? In short, yes. Um, I think they want the truth and they want sincerity, and it's quite hard to find that in the Anglican Church broadly, particularly in the Anglican leadership. There are many um, great parishes and um, vicars, lay people, who are still committed to the gospel in the Anglican Church, but they're being failed by the leadership of the church and by the archbishop in particular. And I think that um, the, the bishop touched on this there, perhaps without necessarily meaning to. When you look at the state of, um, of, of persecuted Christians around the world, um, Christians in the Holy Land or mm -hmm. Christians um, in Africa, 
um, and also in China, where they are also persecuted. There is a, a, a forcefulness... And in Arabic and, countries. And absolutely, particularly in the Middle East, where Christians have been all but wiped out. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the numbers, the dramatic decrease in the population of Christians in the, the countries where, they, where they, they, their communities were originally right. founded. Um, but just to say very, very briefly, that actually that sincerity of belief, holding on to your faith against persecution, I think that when you contrast that to the Anglican church that has become, uh, the leadership has become extremely laissez-faire um, and... Uh, and I, think the word, I think the word you're looking for is complacent. Complacent, absolutely. It's, it's complacent. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that complacency has grown over the, the, the last three or four mm -hmm. decades. Um, this They're is shy. an established church, you know, it can rest on that. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to go out and it doesn't have to it's actually recruit its followers. It's cringing rather than confident about the gospel and that's what the church needs to be. And they think that that is what dissuades young people, but actually it's what attracts young people, is sincerity and truth. And an uncompromising message. This is right, that is wrong. Absolutely. And the Archbishop doesn't do that. Oh, he certainly doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Emma. Well, that's all from me. But up next is Patrick Christus. Uh, and we shall shortly be finding out what is on the bill of fare this evening. And fantastic show. Amazing stuff. Look, I've got a big exclusive with a woman who accosted the police over swastikas on the streets of Britain. Get ready for tent cities full of asylum seekers right across the UK. The Lord's Prayer was read in Urdu. Is it time for the church to stop pandering to other cultures? Will Labour really allow EU nationals to vote in our general elections? They stand accused of rigging the deck. And I dare to ask the question that nobody wants to when it comes to Hamza Yusuf's hate crime act. You'll have to tune in 9 to 11 to find out. And it's been a pleasure filling in for the Right Honourable Sir Jacob Rees-Mogg, and I look forward to being back in his stead sometime soon. I'm Anne Whittacombe, and this has been State of the Nation, and I hope you've all had a lovely Easter. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar and sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello there, welcome to your latest GB News weather. Over the next 24 hours or so, we'll see the heavy showers fade away. It'll often remain quite cloudy, but there will be some brighter spells into Tuesday. Low pressure dominating the weather pattern at the moment, but a slack area of low pressure. So we've had some slow moving heavy showers. These slowly fading away through this evening time. We do have a frontal system as well across parts of Scotland, the far north of England, giving some spells of rain. Into the early hours, we could see some clear spells through this central swathe of the UK. And here, temperatures dipping into low single figures and some further showers running across southern coastal counties of England too. Just a mixed picture for Tuesday, some bright sunny spells across this central part of the UK, Wales into the Midlands for example. This frontal system across eastern parts of Scotland continues to give outbreaks of rain through the day. Into the afternoon we'll see some showers bubble up for many areas but there'll be plenty of sunny spells, some rain in the southwest later. Temperatures in the sunshine reaching around 15 or 16 Celsius, still cold under the cloud and rain for Scotland. Into Wednesday, the next area of low pressure moves in, pushing rain north and eastwards across the country. Some of this could be heavy at times. Behind it, some showers following in, but also some brighter skies. And towards the end of the week, it turns wetter and windier. But with winds from the south, temperatures start to rise. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. You can win our biggest prize giveaway so far. First, there's an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash to spend however you like. Plus, courtesy of Variety Cruises, a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, your next holiday could be on us. Choose any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. We'll also send you packing with these luxury travel gifts. For a chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 